A question I get by atheists sometimes when I do debates, and I've done uh, 99 professors I've debated now, they'll say, well, doesn't the Green River Formation in Wyoming prove the Earth is millions of years old? There's a good article in one of the old creation magazines. I recommend the magazine. I disagree with a couple things on them, but, you know, disagree with everybody on something except me. Picture the Green River Formation. They'll say, oh, each of these layers is a different season, and they go by the pollen. They say some have, there's certain pollen produced by trees in the spring. A different kind of tree produces pollen in the multiple layering, ma massive layering forms quickly. If you dig through this Green River Formation, you find layers of ash in there from apparently a volcanic eruption be consistent throughout the whole thing and it's simply not. So get the article in Creation Magazine if somebody ever says to you the Green River Formation proves the Earth is millions of years old. It does not. And I get asked the question, maybe you've heard the question, what about the Mars rock a hundred few thousand years until they happen to get caught in a gravitational pull of whatever and he thinks there might be stuff on Mars and it would have come from planet Earth. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it, I want you to shoot a two-inch tomato so that a piece of it splatters a third of a mile and lands on a four inch tomato. I think you're asking for obvious folks, we'll keep looking, but thanks for the grant money. You know, they didn't, of course they didn't return it after that. It's just a, simply a carbonate crystal that forms naturally on rocks. The Bible says Eve's the mother of all living. I do not believe there's life on other planets. on what you mean by God, okay? Osama bin Laden believes in God. He's certainly got a different God than I do, okay? The Mormons believe in God. When they say our Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. We'll get into more and most cruel way of evolving new species and more complex organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole is the process which God set up to have evolution. I'm surprised too that anybody would say God used evolution. What kind of God do they have anyway? He's mean, that's for sure. Um, philosopher David Hull said, Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, He is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless. Uh, he is wasteful. He's indifferent. He's almost diabolical. So this is not the God of the Bible, and I would have to agree. Charles Darwin in his book said, uh, From the war of nature, from famine, from death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. See, in evolution, billions of things have to die. He said, the Bible's real clear, and he rested on the seventh day. And he finished his works from the foundation of the world. So the Bible clearly teaches six days of creation rested the seventh day. Over and over it calls it the seventh day. And the Bible says real clearly that man brought death into the world. If theistic evolution is true, then death brought man into the world. Or death was here before man arrived. The fourth thing to consider, I think it's a retarded God that can't make it right first time. He's not worthy of worship, that's for sure. And it certainly, number four, nullifies the need for the death of Christ. Everything about evolution is backwards to the Bible. Every single thing. Nothing matches. You can look at the chart there and see everything's backwards. The Bible says man brought death into the world and probably really honestly loves the Lord in his own way. I do think he has a different God than I do and I suspect that he's probably not a Christian in the biblical sense. He's got a mental acceptance of Christ, but not repentance. And there are some good things you can learn, from, even from the heretics. They teach things that got some really good teaching in there. But you better spit out the bones. When I debated Hugh Ross, I asked him all kinds of questions. We've got the whole thing. Uh, John Ankerberg show taped it for us. And John Ankerberg now is a believer that the earth is billions of years old. And he's a friend of mine, nice guy, but I think that is pure heresy to teach that. In his book, Genesis Solution, my university courses, he was studying astronomy, and he became an astronomer in Canada, okay, PhD in astronomy. Now at the bottom he says, with some more delays and a little more wrestling with personal pride, I don't know. It looks to me, from what he still believes, that he has a mental acceptance of Christ. He is like, I would consider, a Catholic bishop or a pope, who probably very sincere, very dedicated, and just simply doesn't understand repentance and faith. This is more of a mental acceptance rather than a... Uh, real salvation experience. I'm going to cover a lot of this in our college class, so I'm going to skip most things for now. I won't cover them all now, just to hit a few highlights, but in our college class in the 200 series, we will cover a lot of other religions. I mean, there's a lot of ones that are right. You're not quite there yet. You're still climbing? Still climbing. Okay. Uh, so I'm not against other religions. I'm simply for truth and against error. And if the Catholics teach something that is... I was a brand new Christian. I got reading some of their stuff. I said, wow, that seems right until I studied it. Wow, that's not right. So and that's the danger of any young person can be trapped because the first time you hear something, oh wow, I said, well, you better really study this out. 
it seems right at first until you say, oh, wait a minute, is that true? Uh, it's interesting if you read Genesis 27, Jacob and Esau, you know, how Jacob tricked his father. The father went by the feeling instead of by the word. He said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. So he gave him Esau's blessing. And it's, the reason he got tricked is precisely because he went by the feeling. The Mormons will tell you they know they're right because when they prayed about Mormonism, they got a burning in the bosom. They got a feeling, of, oh, wow, this feels right. Feeling. A lot of the charismatics do the same stuff. You know, they have this feeling like, oh, wow, I just feel like I should, you know, do this. We got the demonstration in the science center about the, you blindfold the person on the chair that spins. Any of you ever done that thing? Sit down there, get blindfolded, spin you around. Within 30 seconds, you feel like you're not spinning, even though you still are. And then when you stop the person, they feel like they're turning the other way, even though they're not turning at all. And that's how they're all trying to convert me over to being a Seventh-day Adventist. And they send me all kinds of stuff and don't send me any more. I've already got them all, okay? I don't need any more. I've got lots of books, all the books by Ellen G. White, E.G. White, okay, who wrote, and she was the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not anti-Seventh-day Adventist. I've spoken at some of their churches. And there's a lot of good folks, love the Lord, genuinely saved, going to heaven as much as I am. But what is the truth about the Sabbath? Are we supposed to, you know, work on the seventh, rest on the seventh day? Is that the day of worship or the day of rest? Or what is the truth about the Sabbath? Well, Nehemiah chapter 9, uh, it says, Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai, received the Sabbath from God. That's 2,500 years after the creation. See, I don't have Moses even on that chart, but 2,500 years after the creation, God made the Sabbath known to Moses. Eat someplace because everybody's going out of their house to get there. All right? They talk about a Sabbath day's journey in Acts chapter 1. Jesus traveled on the Sabbath, okay? What's he doing out of his house? You cannot work and you can't make anybody else work, which means you cannot use any utilities. Because if you're using the city water, the city lights, the city gas, you're making somebody work. If you're watching TV, you're making somebody work on the Sabbath. If you go out to eat, you're making somebody work. You can't do that. So he rested the seventh day. The Bible says if they worked on the seventh day, people. People were to look at them and say, wow, that's strange. What's different about you guys? And they were to be a testimony to the world. But he didn't command all the world to keep this. He said the children of Israel. He says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. The Sabbath is for the children of Israel. Again, it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20. Jesus was on the Sabbath day going through the corn. He pleaded, every day is holy. I work seven days a week for the Lord. My whole life is soaked up into God's work. I do nothing else. <laughs> this is it. So people say, do you, do you keep the Sabbath? Oh, yeah. And, and if you want more, he's got brilliant logic and real abrasive, I think, unnecessarily so. But it's good, good logic on why he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you want to get that, you can get it. So I, if you want to keep the Sabbath, you just enjoy yourself. But it's interesting, in Romans 13, he listed some of the commandments. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. The first day of the week, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And I know there's arguments back and forth of which day are we supposed to meet on. I don't care, okay? Most churches meet on Sunday. I don't think they call it a day of worship, though some do. It's the day that they meet. The Sabbath was not designed to be a day of worship. It was designed to be a day of rest. You worship God all seven days. You rest one, that's all. And store, come bring your tithes and offerings and uh, that's when most churches meet, okay? Let no man judge you in meat or drink or holy days or the Sabbath. Don't let anybody tell you you're wrong on that. Okay, none said, people who believe this creation myth, which is unscientific and not in the Bible, despite what they say, haven't really studied theology. I don't know how a nun can be that dumb. If you don't think the creation, pay money to the priest and be absolved. Get your sins forgiven. If you robbed a church, you'd have to pay $2.25. Here's the list of what they had to pay to get out of their sin. If you burn a house, you got to pay two seventy-five. A house robbery, three bucks. Keeping a priest that keeps a mistress can do so if he pays two twenty-five. Okay. Procuring an abortion is a dollar fifty. Murder of parents or wife, two fifty. You can be absolved of all crimes by paying twelve bucks. <laughs> That's how, what's the way to describe that? Stupid? Is that the best way to describe that? Okay. I'm not anti-Catholic. Okay. I'm for truth. I'm against error. That is error to say paying money pays for your sins. And it's error to say burning a candle pays for your sins. Catholic, I'm simply uh, for truth and against error. Keep that thought in mind. Here's a picture of the Pope kissing the Koran. The Catholic Catechism in our library out here, you can read it for yourself. It's a little bitty comic book called The Prophet you can get from our ministry. It's like $2 or something like that uh, by Jack Chick. 
He goes through the history of the Muslim church and how they started. Very few people realize it was the Catholics that started Islam. They started the whole religion purposely to try to get the Holy Land back for the Catholics. They built up the Islam, <clears throat> they, they funded Muhammad, they trained him, they sent a Catholic nun out of the monastery. They said, we want you to come out of your co convent, go find a young promising uh, Muslim, marry him, and train him to raise up an army of Arabs to go take back the Holy Land for the Mother Church. Quite an interesting story if you want to read about that. It, it started to work, but then it failed because the Islam got so big, they said, well, forget you Catholics, we're doing what we want. And I don't think most Muslims, which is now, what, 10, 20 percent of the world population, Islam, I don't think most of them know that they really started off as a, ask the question, when I am dead and buried in the ground and go back to dust, is that all? What will happen to me? Muhammad himself had no clue if he was going to heaven. This uh, verse in, in the Quran says, when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a pond of murky water. Would that be scientifically accurate to say the sun sets in a pond of murky water? Errors. It's not a holy book. Allah commands any person who leaves Islam <coughs> or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. There are over 100 commands in the Quran to kill people who won't convert. Anybody that won't convert has to be killed. And I see Bush and these guys saying, you know, we're trying to bring democracy in Iraq. And the problem with Iraq, like this, and they don't want to do that, but they just, in order to be a good Muslim, you have to kill anybody else who will, won't become Muslim. That's the rules, okay? Islam is a religion where God requires you to send your son to die for him. The Bible is where God sent his son to die for you. <laughs> exactly the opposite, okay? If you study the history of Jerusalem and the problems with Islam, it's phenomenal. Keep in mind, they both come from the two sons of Abraham. Abraham, if he wouldn't have gone down into Egypt and got that Egyptian girl and had that one baby Ishmael, we wouldn't have this whole problem because all the Arabs come from Ishmael. And the price of gas would not be over two bucks a gallon if it hadn't been for Abraham and Hagar, okay? Probably more if the Jews had control of all of it. They like money too. But because he thought they're not Muslim, so they're not really people. Uh, Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall. According to Bahara, Volume 4, that's nice white to go to heaven, to the Muslim heaven. Okay? In the fourth surah, it says, Mary, Men, marry as many women as you like, one, two, three, or four. In Islam, they tell the people you can have four wives, but only four minds you want. Oh, I was only married 15 minutes. There's no law against that. That's their law that says you can do that. In uh, Volume 1, it says, uh, Abu reported, When any of you in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area has written a great book called Islam, America's Trojan Horse. His website's fabulous too, CST for Common Sense Today, news.com. You can read about uh, more about Islam. What do we care where we are if the society be good? Joseph Smith didn't know if he was going to heaven or hell, by the way. God made Aaron to be a mouthpiece to the children of Israel, and he will make me be God, Quakers, and live to be nearly a thousand years old. Well, we've been to the moon a bunch of times now. Are there Quakers up there? This is scientifically inaccurate. Mormon church is excellent. This shows some of the history of how people have been killed trying to leave Mormonism. Because if you start speaking out against Mormonism or try to leave the religion, I mean in the old days especially, you'd get killed. They just find you dead someplace in the middle of the, you know, desert. If you want to read more on that. Mormonism, a way that seemeth right, is also good. Me, this is the more gentle approach. It's uh, just a grandma type, hey honey, you know, do you really believe that? Now, why is that? It's kind of a, a softer, gentler approach to reaching Mormons, if you want to. Somebody else had taken a book to the printer to get printed. It was a, a Baptist who got mad at his church, and he wrote a story about, it was a novel, actually. Well, Joseph Smith apparently got it's supposed to be the most perfect book on earth. He said he got these special seer stones that he would put these golden plates that he got from the angel Moroni. He put them in a hat. He'd look in there with the seer stone, and he had a curtain beside him, and he would read to his friend, Hiram, I believe it was, who, who wrote down everything. When he got done writing all this through the curtain, Hiram never got to see the golden, nobody ever got to see the golden plates. Nobody, except Joseph. He told people about them, okay? There were no golden plates. But he said he translated it through this special seer stone because it was written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was, he's reading the text. Joseph uh, was running through the woods at the top of his speed for three miles with the gold plates tucked under his arm. 
and three people came out and he had to knock three different people down. While he's running with these plates, full blast, with the plates under his arm, golden plates, three people attacked him. He knocked them down with one hand and kept running to the house. The size of the golden plates, this is a picture of what they would have been, this is one that uh, the tanners have in their museum, of the golden plates of the size that Joseph Smith said they were. This is out of lead. Now gold is a lot heavier than lead. The golden plates, that size, the dimensions were given several times, and in in Joseph Smith told them how wide they were, etc. They would weigh 230 pounds. Paul, you lift weighed 1828, when in 1820 the Lord told him all of the churches were wrong and they were an abomination. Why? Just questions. The book uh, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right, is mostly just questions. It's here, in the, here we go. Now, I would differ with these guys on several things, okay? I, I'm not promoting everything they believe, but this book is well done. It's just simply questions to ask Mormons. Like, why does your one book say you have to have more than one wife to be saved, and your other book says if you have more than one wife, you're damned? Which is it? You know, just obvious contradictions in the Mormon religion. And again, I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error. Why weren't the three witnesses in the book to the Book of Mormon taken to Joseph Smith's house and show him the golden plates? Why did he only take them to the woods and they saw the plates in a vision? Nobody ever saw those golden plates. The Book of Mormon says the final battle between the Nephites and Lamanites was on the hill Camara in New York. Well, there had been nothing ever found there, no evidence at all found of a battle where millions died. There are a couple of great DVDs out now called The Bible versus the Book of Mormon and um, Dear honest, intelligent people who have just been absolutely duped, deceived, tricked, lied to. Why would Joseph Smith admonish his people not to drink wine or strong drink and then attempt to construct a bar in the Mason house, mansion house and only reneged when his wife Emma declared, either that bar goes or I go? Heresy, okay? He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. That's what the Mormons teach. Now remember, from the time forth and this time forth and forever, Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost, it says in the book, Journal of Discourses. Mormonism is not a Christian religion. GregorMinistries.org. There are people who have taken, you know, God has led it on, on their heart to, you know, witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they, they're very sincere, really duped. One of the craziest religions on the planet has got to be Jehovah's Witness 16. I went to the Methodist church camp one more time because I'd been going to the Baptist church, but at the Methodist church camp where I had been going before, the counselor sat us boys down on the bed and said, hey, hey guys, who are you? you know, how old are you? Where do you live? Etc. And we told him our names. We're all sitting around in the bunks there. And he said, well, my name is whatever it was, George or something. He said, I'm a student at University of Illinois and I want you to know I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was, so I said, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. He said, uh, I said, well, do you believe the Bible? It says pretty clearly in chapter 1, The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit trees. This happened on the third day. The counselor said, Kent, when did God make the trees? I said, day 3. He said, all right. Verse 20, day 5. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, when did God make the animals out of the dirt? And then he made man. He said, that's chapter 1. Now look at chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And the Lord God planted a garden east. Chapter 2 has plants and trees made after man on day 6. Chapter 1 has birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has birds made out of the ground on day 6. Chapter 1 has animals made before man. Chapter 2 has animals made after man. He said, the Bible's a good book, but it's not God's word. I'd only been saved a couple of months and I was crushed in my faith. It seems to happen to every young Christian. Satan falls, and then he made man, and then he made the garden, and put the man in the garden. Now all of chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only. It's not describing the whole world. Suppose God had made Adam last. Satan could walk in and say, hey Adam, how do you like this beautiful garden I made? And Adam would have doubts the rest of his life. Well, who really made this? I don't know. I trust you, God, but I don't know. He w there's no way he could know. Now, the fact is, Eve never saw God create anything. So who did Satan go to to trick? Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knew full well what he was doing. 
when she walked up and handed him that banana or whatever it was, say it's an apple, I don't know, we don't know, it's a fruit, okay? Knowing full well what he was doing, voluntarily took that fruit, ate it, and said, God, whatever you do to her, you got to do it to me too. That's what I think. Just like Jesus Christ voluntarily became sin for us so that he could save us and we could become the bride of Christ. That'll preach. Okay, as a young Christian, I was reading my Bible and got, came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. And it says, Solomon made a great sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it about. I read that, I set my pi 3.14159265. I said, it should not be thirty cubits around, it should be 31 point, you know, 415, nine cubits around. Why did he say thirty cubits around? I thought the 3,000 baths, 24,000 gallons is a small to mid-sized swimming pool. Okay, it's the kind you put in your backyard. That's a 24,000 gallon pool. That's a lot of water or oil or whatever they're going to put in this thing. Well, Second Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. First Kings says it contained 2,000 baths. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, which is it? 40,000 or 4,000? Now, we sell on our website the Defender's Bible by Henry Morris. I love Henry Morris. The number is given as 4,000 in 2 Chronicles. This is best explained as a copyist error. Well, I read that and I wrote a letter to Henry Morris and said, Brother, I love you. I sell your Bible, but I'm going to have to put a disclaimer in the... No. That, tell me how, that tells me how many horses he had for the chariots, right? For 2 Chronicles. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Oh, no, that's, that's different. And he had... 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, they had 10 horses per stall. 10 horses per chariot, I'm sorry. Not a contradiction at all. King James got it exactly correct. 10 horses per chariot. They would never put one horse per chariot. I mean, one arrow takes out the whole tank. They had chariot teams, actually. NIV got it wrong. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. First Chronicles. David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Well, which, and the chariot is your tank. You don't want to lose that thing. So somebody gets wounded, you know, hurt, bring them back, swap out. They had chariot teams. NIV got it wrong. He killed seven language. When I debated Farrell Till, who's the editor of an um, atheist magazine up in Illinois, he said, oh, the Bible's got a contradiction. Chapter 10 says the languages were divided up, and chapter 11 says the whole world's children killed in school bus accident. Then you start reading the article, and it says, The bus was driving down Highway 12. You say, wait, I thought, I thought they had a wreck. Yeah, the headline is summarizing the story, and now they're going back and giving the details, okay? Chapter 10 summarizes the story, and chapter 11 is going through and giving some of the details. Not a contradiction. Here's another supposed contradiction. How many died in the plague? Numbers 25 says, Those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. So we go through in our college class quite a few of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. If you think there are some, you can uh, contact our office on our, uh, um, during our radio program. We have all kinds of time. We can take an hour and a half. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Is Easter a mistake? All the other versions say, Pass be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel. In the tenth day of this month, take a lamb. April 10th, you pick out a lamb, keep it up for four days. On the fourth day, April 14th, you kill it and you eat it that night. That was the Passover when they were getting ready to go out of Egypt. Okay. And then you put the blood on the two side posts and on the, and the top of your door. It says, They shall eat the flesh that night, April 14th. Kill the lamb, put the blood on the door, eat the lamb that night. Verse 11. It's the Lord's Passover. Eat it in haste, have your shoes on, hold your staff in your hand. Jews today still go through this, you know, every year they go through the Passover celebration. Amazing to watch. We did this as a kid. Uh, my mom had us do this several times. We loved it, okay? Verse 14. This day shall be unto you a memorial. You shall keep it a feast. Verse 15. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Here's the sequence. Tenth day, pick out a lamb, watch it for four days, make days. That that was the seven days of unleavened bread. And they still today do that to commemorate uh, the, with this, the great Passover. It reminds them, so for seven days they eat unleavened bread. Verse 17. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. 
18. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Starting the fourteenth for the next seven days till the twenty-first, eat unleavened bread. Numbers chapter 28. The fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover. And the fifteenth day of the month is the feast. Now there was a pagan festival of Ishtar or Ashtar, or today called Ishtar, it's Easter. That was a pagan festival that always came near the end of April. And it was so many days out itself. You know, things start to grow again. You got Easter lilies. And so that's why they have all kinds of regeneration symbolism in the, in the Easter holiday, Easter bunny, like Playboy. But you need to understand, Christmas and Easter both are pagan holidays, no question. That date anyway is. But I don't think it's nothing worth beating somebody up over. So the feast days are never called Passover anywhere in Scripture. Peter was arrested during the days of unleavened bread. It says so very clearly in Acts 12, which means the Passover was already gone. Has to be. The guy who invented the word Passover is William Tyndale. He made up that word, and he didn't use that word in Acts 12 and in his translation. Let me cover more of that in our college class. How did King program? We'll just cover a couple more because we could spend forever on supposed contradictions. There's a book called The Errors in the King James Bible by Peter Ruckman. It used to be called Problem Texts. It's basically the same. The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and he was three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Okay? Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1, he was in the fish's belly. But when you read the story in Matthew chapter 12, 21st century classification system, a whale is not a fish. But in the biblical classification system, a whale is a fish. If it swims in the water, it's a, a dolphin is a fish in biblical, in biblical classification. And we could talk about some of the little minor stuff. There's about 500 passages that people commonly say are mistakes in the Bible. And all of them are covered in Ruckman's book. He's a little rude, crude, and unnecessarily mean about it, but it's, he's right, okay? And his logic is really good. This one, the atheists love coming up with this one. They'll say, well, do, do insects have four feet? And I say, no. Well, sort of, because I know where they're headed with that one. In Leviticus chapter 11, it says, These may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing, the locust, the beetle, the grasshopper, but other flying, living things, which have four feet, shall be an abomination unto you. They'll say, see, insects have six legs. Everybody knows that. Moses must have been stupid. Well, insects do have six legs, according to our way of thinking. We have a model here of a giant, uh, this is a giant mosquito, okay? Does he have six legs or four legs and two hands? Just because he happens to walk on all six of them doesn't mean they're all legs. I don't think there's a contradiction. I understand all that. And as a brand new Christian, saved out of the Methodist church, uh, I, my mom gave me every kind of new Bible version there was. Well, if a new one came out, hey, son, you're going to love this one. So I've got a huge collection of radical chicken eating Baptist church. And the preacher was banging on the pulpit saying the Bible's the Word of God. And I was making notes in my revised standard version. And after a couple of months, he said, Brother Hovind, you've been a Christian a few months now. Uh, it's time you get us from such people forever. Uh, is that saying the same thing? <laughs> I mean, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. It looks to me like somebody's wrong about this one. Okay? What does this mean? To keep us from such people. What people is it talking about? There are very serious differences between these Bible versions. We've got a book. I don't know if I have it here. It's in our library. When you get to 15 and 1600s, persecution lets up. And so people decided to collect the Bible copies together from all over the world and, and compare them and put it into English. Now keep in mind, some of these copies of the Bible had not seen each other in a thousand years. There might have been people in France that were copying the Bible, and people in Africa copying the Bible, and people in China copying the Bible. And they have, and you can only use a book so long and it wears out. I've got, I don't know how many, absolutely worn out Bibles. Okay? I think I have probably five or six that I've just flat, they're shot. Okay? If you're going to, a book that's in active use, is going to have a, a limited life. And let's just pick a number and say if you were, and after maybe a thousand years, you might be on your fourth or fifth generation from the original, but that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter as long as the copying process was accurate. And a good way to check that copying process and see what happened in the 15 and 1600s. They got all these scrolls together, found 5,000 copies of the Bible that survived the persecution, and they were identical in everything except spelling. People's names, you know, Peter. There was a group of folks, sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses. I've got the Jehovah's Witness Bible here. Um, they were a cult. They came to be known as the Alexandrians. 
The mention of Alexandria in the Bible is when they were disputing with Stephen, arguing with the real Christians. And if you trust the principle of first mention, which I think is very important, then that will be important to you. They say, wow, the only mention of these folks is bad. And so the, anything out of Alexandria, anything out of Egypt, period, in the Bible <laughs> seems to be bad, you know. But Origen started this, or was the primary guy in this cult. They made copies of their Bible also, with their changes in it. And some of them survived. In 350 A.D., several copies were made, and three of those still survive today. One was found in the Vatican Library, and it's called Vaticanus. One was found in Alexandria, Egypt, and it's called Alexandris in the Latin. And one was found in Sinai Peninsula in a monastery. There's this old monastery at the foot of this mountain that some pharaoh or some princess said, that's Mount Sinai, and it's not Mount Sinai, by the way. But uh, she said, oh, that's Mount Sinai. Okay, yes, ma'am. And so they call it Mount, they still call it Mount Sinai. You know, he pulled it out. It was a copy of the Bible, if you can call it that, from 380, or 350 A.D., and so that one's called, uh, uh, so by the way, that, the Latin Vulgate was a really good translation of a bad book. Then the Catholics came along in 1582 and translated the Latin Vulgate into English with the Douay Confraternity or the Douay Reims verse scholars. Uh, I don't know if they were even Christian or not. They probably claimed that they were, like a lot of people do. Okay? But they took these three old ancient, ancient manuscripts. They didn't agree with each other, but they're thinking under... Uh, the revised version, the revised version first, then the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation done in 1950. This was a good translation, fairly good translation of a bad book. Then the New American Standard, the NIV, the Good News, the Amplified, the Living Bible, all of those, and I have a lot of them. Here's the New American Standard. Uh, I think the guys who are doing this are sincere. Are they translating? Okay. The excellent book uh, by Westcott and Hort, if you want to read about that. Here's, for instance, NIV, Acts chapter 8. Let's see, Adam, read verse 37 to me. Now, in the New American Standard, they at least put a footnote. In Acts 8, 37, it says, see footnote. But the verse is gone. Down at the bottom, it says, late manuscripts insert good on understanding the history of how we got our Bible. Or Gail Ripplinger's book, In Awe of Thy Word. It's like 1,200 pages, and it's only like 15 bucks or 18 bucks or something. Really, really a good one. There are many, many books that we offer on the... King James controversy. If you want one that's toned down and kind of, you know, sweet, gentle, and mild, this would be it uh, by Sam Gipp. The Answer Book. Excellent book on why King James. The language of the King James. Why do they use these old words, thee and thou and stuff like that? Oh, there's a good reason for that. But the whole thinking that older is better is simply wrong. And how is Satan also unruly against God? It's not saying the same thing. Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, Genesis 27. That's one of the blessings. Your dwelling shall be away from earth's richness. Away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. They're saying the opposite, folks. It's not the same. Proverbs 18. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. What's that mean? If you want to have a lot of friends, then be friendly. NIV. A man of many companions may come to ruin. Are these saying the same thing? Am I missing something here? If you've got a lot of friends, you'll be ruined. Revised Standard says the gate is narrow and the way is hard. Wait, is it hard to go to heaven or just not many do it? Now they use the these and the thous and there's a reason for that and then we'll go on to another subject here. Uh, if a word starts with Y, it is plural. Ye, your, etc. Okay? If it starts with T, it is singular and there's an important reason. Nobody in 1611 was walking down the street saying, How art thou today? They weren't using that. But the King James translators wisely chose to use the these and the thous because of the distinction. If I walk into a room and say, you come with me, does that mean one of you or all of you? You can't tell. But if you use thee and thou, you can tell. You can see in John chapter 3 very clearly. Jesus said to Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto thee, singular, ye must be born again. He changed it to plural. I'm telling you that everybody must be born again. That's a really important distinction. Otherwise, he'd be saying, Nicodemus, I'm telling you that you've got to be born again. Well, how does that apply to Kent Hovind? It wouldn't apply. The fact is, it's the mighty root of all evil, and they don't want to offend anybody. So, hey, let's sell a Bible version that doesn't offend people. So look what they did with Ephesians 3.9. Which for ages past, hours on the different uh, problems with these verses, the last one that bothers me is, is it the first day in Genesis 1.5? Or is it one day? A question that I get asked just about every week as I travel, what about the Bible codes? Is it true that there's a hidden code in the Bible, in the Hebrew? 
Well, there are all kinds of books that have been written about the Bible code question, and we'll cover those in a second. Hebrew language, and only the Hebrew, and only the King James backed Hebrew, by the way. And you put it in a computer with every single letter in a continuous string of letters. You can make like an acrostic, and by skipping letters, you can't for Adolf Hitler. Every 22 letters spelled out Hitler. Other phrases found in this passage were all kinds of things dealing with Adolf Hitler. How can that be? Work for the government. Okay. <laughs> for many years, okay? He's in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, but he's got some good stuff on the Bible codes. You can get his website, uh, khouse, for coin or not, khouse.org. Plagues, the Fuhrer, Eichmann, King of the Nazis, Genocide, Auschwitz, Germany, Hitler, Mein Kampf. <laughs> I mean, it may be just a little more than coincidence that these things are hidden in there. Something 16th century, long before they had computers, one rabbi said, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of the letters. Here's an example of how it can work. <clears throat> Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. R, E, A, D. Read the code. You skip every four letters, there's a hidden message inside this sentence. You skip every 49 letters, you spell out Torah backwards. And if you go to Deuteronomy and skip every 49 letters, you spell out Torah backwards. Well, wait a minute. Genesis that is real close to zero. It's almost like there must have been something to it. The Torah always points to God. Anyway, who created God? Every week I get some atheist or skeptic who feels himself. Here's Discover Magazine. What happened? What existed before the Big Bang? So in Genesis 1 it says, in the beginning, well, what was before that? I'm going to have to say, evolutionists will say, nothing really means nothing. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. Now they know full well, and it's exactly correct, that if you have, you have to have time, space. Uh, God says He inhabits eternity in Isaiah. Deuteronomy says He's the eternal God. Isaiah says, he, look unto, I am God, there is none else, okay? I am the all, the beginning, that's time, which has three dimensions, by the way, past, present, future. God created the heaven, that space, which has three dimensions, length, width, height, and the earth, matter, has three dimensions, solid, liquid, gas. He did it. So the question, what did God do before the creation, is an invalid question. He is outside of time, space, matter. Out, totally outside of it. Nearly 200 times in the Bible, God's out, and we say, well, we know men wrote the Bible. I mean, come on, God didn't write the Bible. And who wrote Genesis? Well, this is really a fascinating question. Who wrote that book of Genesis? The skeptics for years, like Dr. Pruitt, Eric, you want to meet his, I've debated him four times now at University of West Florida. He's a Genesis scholar. He believes that four different authors wrote Genesis. This is what the Germans, higher critics, started teaching about 106, the word God. When you go to chapter 2, starting with verse 4, there's a change. It says, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, all through chapter 2. It's Moses wrote Exodus. In Deuteronomy, it says, if a man dies, has no children, the brother marries the wife, and the first child gets the inheritance of the dead father to make sure property doesn't get scrambled up. Okay? Moses was the editor of Genesis. He collected it. But there were ten different eyewitness accounts in Genesis. Adam actually wrote part of Genesis. The way to tell where it breaks off, ten, there's no way anybody else would have known those things. But chapter 2, Adam was there for chapter 2. And Adam wrote chapter 2, 3, 4. Chapter 5, he switches off, and they'll say, see, that proves Moses was copying from them. <laughs> no. If you've got 10 people or 20 people that witness an event, and they all go home, and they're going to write their story about what they saw, the first one to publish his story does not necessarily have it right. The fact that somebody published first doesn't mean they got it right. Genesis 5 says this, the generations of Adam. Adam right there wrote actually chapter 5 and part of chapter 6. In chapter 10, verse 1, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Noah's sons wrote part. They wrote some more. And then Shem wrote some more after that. Shem apparently was interested in keeping track of where all the grandkids are t leaving to. And the Genesis chapter 10 is called the Table of Nations, and it goes through 75 different original nationalities. And he kept track of all of them. Oh, yeah, oh, my uncle hurt from their neck <laughs> in the family tree. But uh, some people are just interested in genealogies, all right? I know people that spend their lifetime trying to chase back, you know, like the movie Roots, you know, where did my ancestors come from? Generations of Isaac, generations of Esau. When you read through chapter 35 of Genesis, you read it and say, what is this doing in here? It's all the Dukes of Edom, you know, Duke, uh, and the Dukes of Hazard and all these Dukes in here. No dates are given for these guys and how old they were when their sons were born. The only ones that get the dates mentioned of how old they were when their son was born are those in direct line to genealogy of Jesus Christ.
descriptions of. There's a great footnote in Henry Morris's Defender's Bible. I've got one around here somewhere. But we sell the Defender's Bible. We mentioned that earlier. I got a disclaimer. I disagree with some things, but it's really good. In his article about the, uh, the Teledoth, it advised to listen to your skeptics, you know. If somebody comes, atheist comes up and says, you got bad breath, well, they might be right, okay? Now, if they say, you know, you're wrong about the Bible, well, then they're wrong, okay? But a question I get, again, just about every week is, how did they have days before the sun? Guys like Hugh Ross say, well, maybe the first three days are different because they didn't have the sun. So they might be billions of years long. Well, he made the plants on day three, so I doubt that's billions of years waiting for the sun to come up, okay? But how did they have light before the sun? In Genesis 1, 3, God said, we only have one word, but it means two different things. We know by the context of what we're talking about. I'm talking about turn on the light or light up the room. You know, one is the substance or whatever light is, and the sec first one is, or second one is the, the source of the light. God said, God called the light day, and it was on the first day. Well, apparently it used in verse 14 for light giver. <clears throat> it's the Hebrew word meor. Let there be lights in the firmament. The meor, that's the source of the light, <clears throat> as opposed to just sunlight, maybe even has music involved with it. Besides just light, it might also have music. In Revelation 21, it says they have no need of the sun because God is the light thereof. So it would not be correct to say you have to have the sun in order to have a day that one spin of the earth in relation to anything is a day. Our earth turns once every day. It comes from, you know, of course, all the days of our week are named after pagan holidays. Saturday for Saturn, Saturn Day, Monday for Moon Day, Tuesday for Thor's Day. Uh, all of them have pagan origin, the names of our, our weeks, days of our week do. Okay, where was the Garden of Eden? The Bible says God put a garden eastward in Eden. So where was this beautiful garden? It says in Genesis 2, the river went out of Eden. This can tell you the Garden of Eden was in Pensacola, Florida. I mean, quite obviously. <laughs> I don't think there's any possible way to know where it was, okay? The flood ruined everything. There's a city called New York. People came over from Europe to the New World. They said, oh, wow, that looks like, you know, the old country. Let's call it the same name. That's all it is. If Noah gets off the ark. They've been floating around for a year. They have no clue where they are today. Oh, wait a minute, he just told us on the third day he made the grass plants trees and he made the moving creature that hath life on the fifth day. Is that implying that the plants don't have life? If the things that have life are made on day five, then maybe the plants don't have life in the biblical sense. Living creatures made on day five. Genesis 1.24, let the earth bring forth the living, supposed to eat them. All right? Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. And God did not respect the fruit of the ground. It doesn't have life. The critters, etc. And take unto thee of all food that is eaten. Again, is there a distinction here? Living things get in the ark and the food, which would obviously be the plants. I think there's a distinction. Okay? The beasts, the cattle, the creeping things, the fowls, wherein is the breath of life. The Bible talks about the breath of life in the animals. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one of men, one of beasts, another of birds, different kinds of flesh. He says in Genesis 9, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb. In Genesis 9, he says, Now you can eat things that live and move, whereas before you could eat the green herbs. Again, I see a distinction. Living plants are not alive in the biblical sense. The life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus tells us. The life of the flesh is the blood thereof. He says in Gen out and breaking it loose, you know, if you, otherwise you'd violate this scripture. The <clears throat> Bible talks about the tree of life, which bear twelve manner of fruits. The fruits can give you life. The flag shall wither, Isaiah 19. The reeds shall wither, Isaiah 40. They shall wither, okay? All through the Bible you see the leaves wither and they fade. They are not alive because they don't have bro. Mahaliel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means preaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing, and Noah means rest. I, as a three-dimensional being, would like to reveal myself to you, but you live in flatland. How can a three-dimensional person express himself to a two-dimensional person? Well, you can perceive the depth, but he can only see the width. You and I can see width and height. You do not see depth. You perceive depth. They call it depth perception. You could take a picture of what you're looking at and it would look exactly on flat paper the same as it does in real life. Okay? So, he said, if I want to reveal myself to Mr. Flat or Mrs. Flat, I walk over and I stick my finger through the table. And Hoven, he's three circles. 
and they're going to split the church and start the church of the one circle and the church of the three circles, I'm sure. But neither one <laughs> understands me. They've each only seen just a little bitty slice of the reason Atlanta, Georgia. This guy was visiting from Ethiopia, and I was probably seven years old, and I couldn't believe it. Not only was he black, his wife was black, and they had a baby that was black. I mean, black, black. Produced all the varieties in their own children. It's simply a melanin, a melanin count in the skin. There's a black couple that had three albino children. They didn't have much melanin in their skin. Okay. God the Father has thousands of wives, and He has sex with all these wives, and they produce spirit babies. Those spirit babies, if they're valiant, they come down to earth and get a white-skinned body. If they're not valiant, they come down and get a black-skinned body. So they look at black people and think, well, you were, just, you were just inferior in your first life. What a dumb way to live. But that's what the Mormons teach, okay? They said, Cain, Ham, the whole Negro race have been cursed with black skin, the mark of Cain. This guy said, if, I, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I read to you, they receive the curse. Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the chose, white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty is death on the spot. And the good book, Secret History of the Mormon Church, Noah's grandson. If you read Genesis chapter 9, it says, uh, Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall be. But where do you get black people are supposed to be servants out of that? Aren't you assuming that Canaan was black and this curse applies to him? I don't believe that one either. The fourth theory, and I think the only logical theory in all of this, was unusual traits to become very pronounced. For instance, for years the Habsburgs had to marry royalty. That's just the rule. Well, sometimes the only royalty available to marry was your niece or your account, believe it or not. You read Genesis 10 and see if you can count it. Try to do better than that. Okay? It's hard to tell who goes with who. But by my count, 14 kids and grandkids for Japheth. Ham had 31 kids and grandkids. One, Egypt is the land of Ham. The children of Ham migrated to Egypt. Africa was actually settled by the descendants of Ham. Black people apparently... Most folks who study English will tell you that English, German, and Danish have a common root language. There are hundreds and hundreds of words that are identical. Here's Beowulf poem in 518 AD. This is English, actually, from 1500 years ago. Today's English is nothing like ancient English, and ancient English was very Germanic. Okay? Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin for garden is dust plus breath plus two people in an enclosure. There's also more in this book, uh, Search for the Truth, uh, by Bruce Malone. A lot of his articles in here are really good on that. Today there are about 1,200 recognized languages plus thousands and thousands of dialects. They probably all broke up from the original 75 languages, just like, you know, Australian, Irish, and Georgian, people from Georgia or Alabama. Believe it or not, they all speak English, but it's a different dialect of English, okay? And if it weren't for rapid communication across the world today, they would be totally indecipherable in a few generations. When we were in Australia, I was at the restaurant. I said to the waitress, I said, ma'am, would you get me a napkin? The preacher said, don't, 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 don't say that. Have we not all one father? There's no reason to be a racist because of your skin color. We cover more on that on video five. They did a search for Adam and Eve, trying to find, you know, do we have a common ancestor? Using mitochondrial DNA changes, mitochondrial DNA, and said, wow, no, we all have a common ancestor only 6,000 years ago. And they said, no, that can't be right. Let's keep studying. Well, yeah, actually, we did have a common mother, science correspondent in Weekly Telegraph in UK. Everyone in the world is descended from a single person who lived around 3,500 years ago, according to a new study. Scientists worked out the most recent common ancestor of all 6 billion people alive today, probably dwelt in Eastern Asia around 1400 BC. Although the date may seem relatively recent, Researchers say the findings should not come as a surprise. Anyone trying to trace their family tree soon discovers the number of direct ancestors doubles every 20 years. How many of you have two parents? How many of you have four? Back the most recent common ancestor using estimated patterns of migration through history, and they found out we all came from a common ancestor three or 4,000 years ago. I could have told them that. Well, there's quite a bit of uncertainty of what may happen with cloning. We're not sure exactly what you might end up with. You know, uh, <laughs> half Hillary, half chimpanzee. But uh, the DNA is an incredibly complex molecule, unbelievably complex. What they're doing with cloning is they're transplanting <clears throat> the DNA from one cell to another cell. They're not creating DNA, located and very expensive, but they're not really creating anything. The DNA in your body is phenomenal. We cover all that on video number 
4 about the complexity of DNA. Now Dolly, as far as we know, was the first... Okay. Cloning is, is happening all over. I think it's a waste of time and money. Interesting research. I'm not against research. I'm not against science. But I think it's a waste of time. And if the theory is we're going to clone humans so that we can have organs to harvest to save us from diseases, now you've got a really expensive fix to most diseases which are a really simple cure. Vitamins, minerals, nutrition. We cover that on our videotape, The Bible and Health. And uh, Amy asked me, Sir Brother would you please cover in your Q&A what vitamins you take? I take all kinds of vitamins and we cover And I'm you know, going to make that my goal. So <clears throat> this question I get asked in a debate one time. This atheist said, Hoven, if God made a perfect world, why did he make poisonous snakes? Good, fair question. There's no question. There's a lot of poisonous snakes. And what about mosquitoes? You know, didn't they... Uh, didn't they bite Adam and Eve? Wouldn't that be painful? Wasn't there pain in the Garden of Eden? You know, what about poisonous spiders, etc.? Fair, honest, legitimate questions. Well, uh, if you get this article from JARS, Jungle Aviation and uh, Radio Service, you'll see where they talk about using electricity to treat snake bites. Dr. Roger uh, Gadarian in western Ecuador treated 300 cases of snake bite. The pain is gone in 15 minutes if shock is applied within 30 minutes. What they do is they use a stun gun, makes a little electric spark. If you get bit by a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, they've discovered over the last 20 years, a lot of research has been done, a spark right on the injury site will neutralize the poison. They say if you get bit by a snake, do it in an X pattern, once this way, once this way. If it's been more than 30 minutes, In more than 30 minutes, you probably should also spark halfway from the injury to the heart because the poison's traveling. Uh, a friend of mine said they had a lady come visit their place in Texas, and the, they had a two-year-old two -year boy with them. The two-year-old got bit by a brown recluse spider, which can kill a two-year-old. Wouldn't kill a human, but it'd make you hurt for a long time. We got brown recluse right here in Pensacola. This little brown recluse spider bit this two-year-old right on the thigh. Within a few minutes, it was swelled up as big as a softball and rock hard and red with a spot in the middle. The kid is screaming uncontrollably. This friend of mine uh, talking to this lady, and she said, what do I do? He said, I'll tell you what I would do. I'd shock it with a stun gun. He said, I happen to have one, but I'm no doctor. I'm not going to give you medical advice. But if you want to borrow my stun gun, I would shock it twice in an X pattern. Well, she did on this two-year-old. Within probably 30 seconds, he quit crying. In less than a minute, the swelling was gone. I was down there going to pull the weeds out under that drinking fountain, and there's a wasp nest down there. I didn't know that. One of them came out, zap, stung me on the finger. So I went right upstairs to the Van de Graaff generator, 500,000 volt, make your hair stand up generator, flipped the switch, zap, zap, zap. Instantly, I, I mean, less than a half a second, the pain was gone from the wasp sting. I couldn't believe it. Just bam, gone. Done on this. So why did God make poisonous snakes? I don't think they were poisonous in the original creation. Carl Ball, for instance, in Glen Rose, Texas, raised uh, cotton, cotton mouth water moccasins in his hyperbaric chamber with a stronger electromagnetic field. After two weeks of being in strong magnetic field, the snakes were not poisonous. The poison was not harmful. So you can study more on that. Water moccasins raised in hyperbaric Calvary Baptist. I think you spoke in there, Eric, on uh, Pine Forest Road. She was in a car accident, hit the windshield, broke her neck down deep inside her, between her shoulder blades. She goes in once a month, still today, for an injection of cobra venom. They take the venom from a cobra, stick it down on her neck, and give her a shot because it's a nutritious protein. I don't know what they did to it. You could ask her if you'd like. But So maybe the snakes had a beneficial function. And so to say, hey, we have rattlesnakes, therefore God is mean, is to totally misunderstand the creation concept. Okay, what about the Ark of the Covenant? The Bible says in Jeremiah, that they took the spoons, the cups, the basins, the candles. It names all kinds of small things that were taken captive out of Israel. Then in Ezra, when they're bringing the stuff back, it mentions, well, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to besiege Jerusalem and take over the city, but he didn't want his soldiers getting hit by those rocks. So they calculated how far the rocks could go and built a wall. I will tell everybody in the city, surrender. I want these guys to win. You have been evil, you are wicked, and this is your punishment. Don't fight them. Go with them. Be their slaves. Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant and the temple furniture from the temple outside the city. There's a tunnel called Jeremiah's Passageway 
that's caved in in several spots, arrows pointing, that is Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. The garden tomb is right there. I was there a couple years ago. I'm going again in the spring back to Jerusalem. Oh, it's incredible. If you get a chance to go to the Holy Land 99, and his, you can get all of his uh, discoveries from our ministry. There's only, I think, two people that sell his DVDs, him and us. 100 bucks for his DVD series. It's phenomenal. If you want to watch, there's what, Paul, Paul, five DVDs, I think. Or, yeah. If you want to get all of Ron Wyatt's discoveries, you can see more about this. Just contact our ministry, 100 bucks, and get it. But Ron said he was digging outside there in Jeremiah's Grotto. And I'm in our, in our video series, uh, Creation Science, uh, Answering the Critics. We cover some of that in this DVD series, if you want to get all those DVDs about our answers to the critics. But Ron said he squeezed down in this little hole, and there's a little cave about four feet high, and he saw several things in there. As he looked around with his flashlight, he found, for instance, the table of showbread. The golden table that the Jews had built 3,000 years ago. Jeremiah, that's correct. I mean, I don't know, but it, it preaches good, at least. Apparently, Jesus died on the cross, and his blood ran right down onto the mercy seat, which is where the blood was supposed to go when there was a sacrifice. Because your ark, they said, oh, we're not going to touch that. They, it's still there, waiting for the new temple to be built. Then they're going to get it out and put it in the temple. So you can go to wyattmuseum.com and talk to Richard. He, he'll just say, I saw it. Richard, I've spoken there a couple times. He's got a great sermon on this topic, and you ought to get a hold of him to get that. Is God's name in Jerusalem? Well, the Hebrew alphabet has all these different letters in it. One of them looks kind of like a W, God's house, okay? God said His name will be upon the children of Israel. He will put my name there forever, 1 Kings chapter 9. In Jerusalem will I put my name. In Jerusalem I will put my name forever, 2 Kings 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Is God's name actually in Jerusalem? Apparently so, because there are three valleys that form a shin. His name is permanently stamped there on this city. So that, that preaches good. I don't know. Okay, what about Bigfoot? I get asked the question all the time, hey, what about Bigfoot? Bigfoot lives. Deal with it. Chester Moore Jr. is a good friend of mine from the Houston area. I spoke at their cryptozoology conference. What about Big? Whatever these creatures are, some are certainly hoaxes and fakes and frauds, no question, okay? But they've been seen in just about every state. There are several theories about Bigfoot. Since I've interviewed 10 people who've seen one, and because the question comes up, I'm going to answer it. But it's not something I deal with. I deal with creation. Here are the theories. Some people say they're all hoaxes or misidentified. Well, hoaxes, sight. Look at that thing moving. Bam! What is it? I don't know, George. Let's go check it out. You know, that's just shoot first, ask questions later. You know, that's just the way it is, all right? The second theory says they're unidentified species of ape. That could be true. This is a Discovery Channel last night had a section on, you know, what is this Bigfoot stuff? Some people think they're some of the hippies from the 60s that haven't come in yet. They're hairy and they stink. If okay. you see one, let me know. I'd like to hear about it. Look, Genesis chapter 6 says there were giants in the earth in those days. Well, who were these giants? It came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, which always refers to angels in the Old Testament, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always say it's going to be 120 years till the flood. I don't know. Maybe it means there's going to be 120 jubilee years of human history. Every 50 years was the year of jubilee. 120 times 50 is 6,000. I don't know. If you know, let me know, but I don't. But, but anyway, back to the giants. It says, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the... But who were these giants? And who were these mighty men? It's the Hebrew word Nephilim. Who were the Nephilim? Well, some people think that Jude, verse 6, it's only got one chapter. They think Jude, verse... Really, does this tie in? Other people think uh, Peter. The Peter passage ties in. First Peter says, The spirits in prison waited in the days of Noah. Are these spirits in prison and the angels that kept not their first estate and the giants... Is this referring to the same thing? I'm going to give that a definite probably, but I don't know how you could prove such a thing. Here are the theories about these. It doesn't mean they can't marry on earth. And it assumes that Revelation 12 means a third of the angels followed Satan. You guys going through Bible college, why do we always teach a third of the angels followed Satan? The passage in Revelation says, Satan drew a third of the stars with his tail. That's it. That's the only verse they're using to say a third of the angels followed Satan. There's no question Satan has helpers and demons and all that stuff, but we're, I don't think the Bible tells us. So either we don't need to know, or it just simply doesn't matter. But don't worry about it. There's not enough information. The second theory says, 
it's the sons of God referring to the line of Seth, and they're marrying the kid, the Cain's descendants, intermarrying of the godly and ungodly line. I think that's a ridiculous theory, because saved and unsaved people get married all the time, and it doesn't affect their children as far as they don't become giants, because one's saved and one's lost, okay? Secondly, there's no evidence sons and daughters. Noah's own cousins didn't come on the ark. Brothers and sisters didn't. Chuck mister has got a good uh, audio tape series about the Nephilim. If you want to read and listen and study more on that, he thinks not only were they you know, genetic experiments, but they're coming back. And Satan's going to use this again to infl infiltrate humanity. You can get Chuck Missler's stuff on that. But whatever these Nephilim were, it would appear to me that Noah's kids would have seen them. Genesis 6, the first five verses, is talking taking place just before the flood. And so God said to Noah, build the ark and we're going to have a flood. After the flood's over, they're going to tell stories to their kids sitting around the campfire. Oh, you should have seen the guy that lived down the street from us. Man, oh man, he had three eyes and could fly or who knows, you know. <laughs> but these the earth in those days and maybe that's what it is. You study it for yourself. Next question. What about UFOs, unidentified flying objects? What are they? I don't know and I'm not sure how it ties in. And hundreds and hundreds of books that have been written about UFOs. Gulf Breeze right down here, six miles away, is famous for its UFO sightings. So what are the UFOs? There have been many Christian books written on the topic and many heathen books written on the topic. We have uh, these two, uh, UFO, End Time Delusion, and a kind of Reader's Digest smaller version by the same author, condensing, condensing the information, UFO 666. There's a great book uh, by Chuck Missler again called Alien Encounters, if you want to read his theory on UFOs. And he's one of the smartest guys I know. There's a... I asked Chuck Missler a few months ago when I was preaching out there at a conference with him. I said, Dr. Missler, what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico? What is the truth about this? You know, the UFO crash site. He said, Brother Hovind, I don't know for sure, and nobody who knows is talking. But exactly nine months later, Al Gore was born. So <laughs> what happened? I, I don't know that'll preach, but propulsion. And I mentioned this in a seminar years ago, and a guy came to me and he said, Brother Hovind, I work for the government, and uh, how do you know about electrogravitic propulsion? That's top secret. I said, I read a book about it. I'm so gas, a mirage, too much vodka, whatever, okay? Second theory says they're top secret or government or private experiments. And third theory says they're satanic or demonic. See, God is all places. It's not logical to say Satan fell before the sixth day of creation because God said everything was very good. But God drove man out and put him at the east of the Garden of Eden and put some angels and cherubims there and says, don't come back. So I don't think uh, they were in the Garden of Eden it had to be out before Cain and Abel were born and before Seth was born, so it could have been a hundred years. There's no way to tell, but certainly hundred series. But the Bible says they're going to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead, and you cannot buy or sell without this mark. I have studied this a lot. I'm sure no expert, but I believe we've already got it available. Speak to our staff about the microchip. He took one of these little chips, put it under his arm, and walked past his laptop computer, which had a little sensor built into it. Are you here for that, Diane? And up on the screen flashed his name, address, speed pass. You walk up, pump your gas, touch the pump, get in your car and drive off. McDonald's is doing this. You carry a little chip on a keychain. You walk up, touch the McDonald's cash register, pay for your food. Anybody ever seen that before? Which only holds 128 bits. But that's the size of it right there. 0.4 millimeters. You can put it inside a piece of paper and not find it. There's a family in Florida a couple years ago was real proud of themselves. They put microchips in because they have health problems. And in case they get you know, uh, hurt in an accident, they can scan their body and find out, oh, this is, it gets its energy from an outside source. Well, Carl Sanders has a whole bunch of stuff on this microchip technology. You can get a hold of him in Arkansas if you want. Uh, put his website up here. But as far as using money, the Bible says the love of money, root of all evil. This microchip technology is going to be used to develop uh, one world currency. All cash is going to become obsolete. A research project, H-A-A-R-P. They've been doing research for years trying to use the high aurora, the aurora where the northern lights are, to control weather. There's a law that apparently are for this purpose. They drill a hole in the ground, everything seems to be below ground, probably for multiple reasons. I was at a debate here recently and somebody said, well, doesn't the Shroud of Turin prove that Jesus Christ lived on earth? Well, I don't need the Shroud of Turin to prove Jesus lived on earth, but what about the Shroud of Turin? Somebody sent me this book and said, Oh, Brother Hovind, you got to read this. This is proof that Jesus was buried in the burial cloth. In John chapter 20, it says, Peter went in and saw the linen clothes lie and the napkin about his head, not lying with the clothes, but in a place by itself. 
The Shroud of Turin has one cloth covering the head and the body. It's, at least the image does, okay? Jesus did not have long hair. He was not a Nazarite. He was from Nazareth, okay? The custom of that day was to have short hair. If the custom was to have short hair, then why did Judas have to kiss him to pick him out of the crowd if Jesus had long hair? He could just say, hey, he's the long-haired guy. Go get him. No, Jesus had short hair like everybody else, okay? So, Jesus went secretly uh, to the feast. Nobody picked him out as unusual. He looked just like everybody else, okay? He was not a Nazarite from Numbers chapter 6. That was a vow they took not to cut their hair. It might even be a cloth somebody who was crucified was buried in. I wouldn't argue any of that, but it's not Jesus. That's for sure. Okay, when my son Eric was in Bible college, he had a teacher there that taught him the word create word twice. You wouldn't say, wow, he was huge, he was huge. You would say, wow, he was huge, he was big. You pick a new word for emphasis. Created and made are used interchangeably, all through scriptures. The Bible says the Lord made the heavens, 1 Corinthians. He made the trees, but he also created the trees. He made man, he also created man. He made man in our image, so he created man in his own image. Right in the same verse. I mean, no, it's not anything you could use to, uh, to justify the gap theory or uh, ruined creation, ruined restoration theory. The Hebrew word created is bara, and formed is yatsar, and made is asa. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing them right, I don't speak Hebrew. But here they're used all in the same verse. Every, Isaiah 43, verse, I mean, it can't be more clear. It's talking about the same thing. I created thee, O Jacob, that, and he that formed thee, O Israel. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Again, it's for emphasis. Not enough to make a whole doctrine on. So these words, you know, uh, form, create, made, are used interchangeably all through Scripture. It's just simply for emphasis. So where do you take courses on for doctor's degrees and the offered PhDs? They have now changed their name to Patriot Bible University. That was done just in the last few years. It used to be just simply Patriot University when I went there, okay? I wrestled with, should I even finish it? For fear that it might be a hindrance instead of a help. And I finally did. I ended up with two PH, a PhD and a doctorate in uh, divinity. I have a doctor's divinity and divinity. You can contact them yourself, okay? I worked pretty hard for my degree. I don't know if they worked hard for theirs or not. About 25 graduates a year. So yes, I have a PhD. And Darwin's degree was in um, theology, missionary science that they pursued. Those are the only two guys. But most people that are involved in evolution in the early days uh, were surveyors or engineers and had nothing to do with uh, uh, biology. Yet we call them the fathers of uh, evolution. I do have an earned PhD from a non-accredited Christian university. I've always said that. Thousands of major world leaders throughout history had no degrees of any kind. Thousands lie or bribe their way to get a degree. I didn't do any of those, okay? Getting a degree from an accredited university does not guarantee any level of intelligence. I mean, most of them still believe they came from a rock, for heaven's sake, okay? <clears throat> if you don't like my degree, then call me Cantor or Bubba and let's get back to the topic. If I were dumb or desperate, I could travel to universities around the world and take pictures of where their actual degree... Many atheists ask very fair questions, and it's time Christians be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in you. And I'm sorry this taping has gone so long for part seven, but there's a lot of questions that get asked. And we do many more on our uh, radio series, radio program every day from 4.30 to 6 central time. You can call in on truthradio.com or drdino.com. But in Exodus chapter 14, God told Moses to go and camp by the spot, the Red Sea crossing. It says, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. If you look at the country of Egypt in the lower right-hand corner of this map, you'll see Egypt has the Red Sea right beside us. They went all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and crossed over there on the right at the Gulf of Aqaba. Right where that red dot is next to the Gulf of Aqaba is actually a beach. <clears throat> There's a dry riverbed that runs right up to that beach, and it's mountains on both sides and no escape any place, certainly not with a bunch of people with their families, you know, kids and wagons and animals and stuff like that, and ended up stuck on that beach. That beach is huge. Uh, those are little buildings, those little squares on there are actually warehouses and stuff. It's a monster beach, big enough to hold two or three million people, no problem. So here's the children of Israel stuck on the beach. They can't go north or south. There's mountains both ways. They can't go back. There's Pharaoh's army coming through the gap, and they can't go ahead. There's a Red Sea in front of them. So what do you do? Straight and put more dirt around it because it was kind of leaning over. He climbed up to the top of it. Right there at the, where this beach is, <clears throat> is a, it's about eight miles across the Red Sea. Well, at that point, there's a shallow spot. The deep uh, up toward e the city of Elat, where I was a few years ago, uh, is about 5,000 feet deep on both sides. This whole 
slope down, gentle slope back up. And if you go scuba diving, scuba diving down there, you'll see the rocks have been moved out of the way. Somebody cleared a path across the bottom of the Red Sea, probably done by Moses and the people. The Bible says Pharaoh's army drowned trying to cross the Red Sea. The waters were a wall unto them. To walk eight miles would take, you know, half a day with all the children of Israel pulling. They said, oh, wow, this is from the 18th dynasty. He said, how do you know that? They said, well, the 18th dynasty is the only one that used four, six, and eight-spoke chariot wheels, and all three were down there. So the Sinai Peninsula is not where Mount Sinai is. Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Right over there in that red section there is actually the holy precinct where Mount Sinai is. Galatians tells us Sinai is in Arabia. Burn the rock. At the bottom, you can see the outline where the border was set up, because remember Moses told the children of Israel, don't come up onto the mountain, and they put it, but says they established a border. Well, the pillars are still there. There's also apparently the altar that Aaron made with a golden calf. They you know, made the golden calf on the altar, but on the side of the altar, they drew a picture of a calf or cow. Still there. God told Moses to smite the rock and water would come out. Well, most of the Bible story picture books have you know, a little trickle of water coming out of a rock and somebody holding a cup. <laughs> How are you going to feed or water rock that Moses smote? That rock sticking up on that mountain is five stories tall. 50 feet to the top of that rock, as tall as these trees around here, and it's split right down the Sodom and Gomorrah. The Dead Sea in Israel has five spots along there that are just real high salt concentration and totally destroyed landscape. Chapter 14 in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and get more on this. But God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Apparently, Sodom and Gomorrah are right there along the south end of the Dead Sea, right towers and of an ancient wall well, that's the way they built their cities back then. If you make it up over one wall, you got the enemy dumping arrows and hot oil and things down on you, you know, from the second wall. Not a good place. 99.9% .9 sulfur and they're burned out, okay? If you break them open, some are still yellow inside. Most of them are pretty badly burned. Some of them are bigger, like golf ball size, but millions of these out here. Sulfur balls from Sodom and Gomorrah. Apparently, the cities were actually burned up. If you dig into the ash, it looks like just a cliff of ash. That's actually the old city wall. I mean, that was the brick in there. We've got one that apparently is a part of a human bone that was baked. It's in our museum, if you want to see that one out there. So I believe, I believe they found Sodom and Gomorrah, and you can check the video, Discovery's videos if you want more on that. The unicorn was necessarily a horse with a horn, probably more like a reptile, giant reptile. All right, question. Do wisdom teeth prove evolution? Well, Jack Cuazzo, is, why are some names missing in the Bible? Well, before we get into the, miss, the three missing names in the genealogy, uh, you need to understand the Bible says be careful about endless genealogies which minister questions, okay? It's pretty tough to follow some of the genealogies. But if you look at the genealogy in Genesis and Matthew and Luke, it gives the genealogy to Christ or part of the genealogy to Christ in Genesis. or anything yet, but uh, the, 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 Canaan, is one of three names that is in the genealogy, in some genealogy, genealogies, but not in other genealogies. Why was when Abram was born? I'm aware of the discrepancy. Some people say Terah was 70. Some people say Terah was 130. 60 year difference. And we cover all that on our website also. Uh, why we chose to use the 130, so they just, I don't know, got adapted to eating meat or something. But there's a lion, it was used for years in the movie sets, that uh, refused to eat meat, called Little Tyke. Lived to be, you know, I think nine years old, never animals in London. Vegetables, that's all they had. They lived on cabbage. A guy sent me a videotape of two hours of grizzly bears in his front yard up in Canada eating grass. Okay? So that's why I don't think it's uh, something we can prove when it happened, but I suspect it happened before the flood came. They became carnivorous or shortly after the flood. All right, we'll probably redo this someday. All the skeptics, there are nearly 2,000 anti hovend websites out there. So why do you answer them and be sarcastic? Well, in my 30-some years in the ministry, no, they're lying to support their theory. We cover that on video four. The Bible talks about beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit in Colossians chapter 2. If I were, rock music was invented. Come on, Baal, light my fire. He was singing, okay? Some of you old-timers recognize that song. But here's, here's a preacher mocking the false prophets. Oh, you say, that's not very tolerant. That's correct. Not tolerant at all. You're calling a political leader a fox? Yeah. I've called Bill Clinton and some of our presidents and leaders pretty bad names too, okay? I think you should if they're doing evil. 
The Bible talks about the stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, you full of all subtlety and mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, you pervert. I mean, the Bible's pretty strong, okay? All through the Bible, God calls people fools, send them in. I have a standing offer to debate any evolutionist anywhere in front of their university. I'll pay them 200 bucks if they'll debate me and pay them a quarter million if they've got evidence for evolution. So far, half my yard was good dirt and the other half is hard rock. I'm going to plant the good dirt first. If I get time, then I'll go work on the rock. If I don't get time, oh well, I didn't get time. And there are so many millions who want to hear, I'm going to work on those first. And then those who don't want to hear, well, I'll get to them if, if I get time. That's why. I just don't waste much time with that. All right, well, hope you've enjoyed our question answer session. I know it's been a to give an answer, and that's what I want to do. I want to please Him and win souls to His kingdom. So if you have things that are keeping you from trusting Christ as your Savior, get them resolved. There is an answer out there. I may not have it, but I might know who does, and I can steer you that direction. If you're listening to this tape or coming to one of our seminars and you're not sure you're going to heaven, the most important thing you need to do is give your heart to Jesus Christ and be saved. On the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.